Good morning. Hey, welcome to Foundation. So excited that you are here uh, joining us either in the room or on your device somewhere else in the world. It's amazing. There's about 1,500 people on a weekend that join us via device. So if that's you, wherever you're at this morning, you're glad that you are here because this is our time to come together and to hear from God's word, to be encouraged and challenged by his truth and excited that you're here because, man, good things are going on. I love our announcements because it's just a way of saying God is doing really amazing things, giving him glory, self celebrating what he is doing. Um, I'm excited to just highlight a few things this morning. First of all, um, this week, we start demolition at the Windsor site. So that is awesome. Um, they, they haven't asked me to help yet, um, but I am more than willing, and that's about the only thing. I'm not so good at construction, but destruction, I've got a master's degree. So um, excited about maybe doing some of that or at least getting our building renovated. And as you know, we're really excited about what God is doing through growing uh, his kingdom as we expand as a little part of his kingdom into, found, into Foundations Windsor, into that building, into that community. Uh, we're already there, but just excited about going. So uh, I would invite you as you walk out to see what already has been done in terms of the giving towards the Windsor site. I've got a huge thermometer on the wall, and as you'll see, the goal is 2.2 million, and we're already halfway there. So if you've already given, thank you so much. We know a lot of people are praying for that. Would encourage you just to continue praying as God leads you. Uh, we want to make sure that this is something that's powerful, and, and we want to put all of our uh, invest our time, our energy, our, even our, our finances into it. So I encourage you to do that as you are led by God, it's exciting. Now, here's what's super cool. And you already heard this, and I was just expecting you to like, just like, Rah! during the announcements. But, but just in case you missed it, we did a, a kids camp Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday last week. So many people put time and effort into that to work with 500 plus kids. So if you can imagine 500 kids running around this building, and they all survived, at least I'm told, um, but it was crazy. More importantly than that, um, man, all the volunteers did a fantastic job. Ali Skelton did a fantastic job. We thank her and the team that was working there. But over 100 kids gave their life to the Lord. Man, that's, that's so cool. That, that, is, that, is what, that is what we are all about, is transforming lives. And the majority of people who come to know Jesus do so under the age of 18. So to be able to sit, and it was my, my privilege to be able to pray with a number of children to receive the Lord and to look eyeball to eyeball and be like, dude, your life has started early, right? You're going to be walking with the Lord for so long now, excited about that. And then on Friday, we had a concert, and 20-plus people gave their life to Jesus at that concert. So it's, yeah, man, that's, that's why we do what we do. So to see the gospel going forward and lives being changed and transformed by the grace of God is fantastic. Now, it's not just about coming to know Jesus, but we want to make sure people are growing and connected. So you heard about life groups. That's so important. I, I encourage you, if you're not part of a small group where you know people and you are known by people, please sign up for a life group. This week is a great time to do it. If you're like, man, I'm not ready for a group yet, we've got a sports and rec opportunity. We've got several different things you can be a part of. You can kick a soccer ball. You can throw a softball. There's lots of stuff. Even if you're terrible, there's a lot of grace in church league. So um, sometimes not though. I mean, there's some fights in church league too, right? At least I've been told. So we would love for you to get involved in community in some way. All right. So I'm going to try to, to slow my rate of speed right now. <laughs> Take a deep breath. And as we pray, we're going to get into God's word. So would you pray with me and we'll get started. Father God, we thank you for the powerful things that you are doing the changed lives that we see. And Father, we know that that is all about you. You are the one who is doing that. So we stop even in this moment and we give you praise, glory, and honor. Thank you. Thank you for being not just powerful, all-knowing, strong, holy, but for being merciful, loving, and graceful. God, thank you so much that you're working in our lives right now. I pray during this time that you would open up our ears and open up our hearts to receive the truth and the power of your love and your grace, that each one of us would experience you in a way that is transformational and that we would leave differently than we came, even if it's with a, a new extra sense of hope, a, 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 just to push through for the next couple days, God, whatever you have for us, God, we open ourselves up to receive it and ask you to do amazing things for your glory 
and for our good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are in the middle of a series called Gospel Gold. And when at first I heard the name of the series and I saw the logo, I thought it was like a disco collection, you know? Like, it seriously, you know, thank you for laughing. I thought village people maybe, but apparently not. Uh, we're going to be going through the Gospels, and we have the past two weeks, Pastor Carl has gone through the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark, and today we are in the Gospel of Luke. And the point of Gospel Gold is to see the awesome things that are recorded in the accurate historical accounts within the Gospels, the different perspectives that the authors give, and their ultimate point is to point us to salvation through Jesus and putting our faith and trust in him. And so what we see, we want to start with, well, well, who wrote the Gospel of Luke? This is a total like softball pitch. Who wrote the Gospel of Luke? Okay, wow, that was not a lot of answers there. (laughs) Just say Luke really quick. There you go. Okay, so you're 100% right now. Now's a good time to knock off and just go grab a bite to eat. So the Gospel of Luke was written by a guy named Luke. Now, what do we know about Luke? Um, We know about Luke because not only did he write the Gospel of Luke, but he wrote the book of Acts. And the Apostle Paul talks about him three different places in the New Testament. And what we know about Luke is that he was probably a Gentile believer. So he came to faith not as a first-generation eyewitness, but he came to faith as a witness of those who had seen Jesus. And so not only is he a Gentile, but he's writing to a largely Gentile audience. So his Gospel looks a little different than the other four Gospels. Now, what Paul calls Luke is is the beloved physician. So Luke is a doctor. He's well-educated, and his writing in the original Greek reflects that. He's very meticulous. He's very organized. What we also know about Luke is that the dude is tough. What Paul writes in 2 Timothy is he said, Everybody else left me. I got thrown in prison. Everybody, all the other brothers abandoned me except for Luke. So we know Luke is not only a guy who knows a lot, but he's a guy of character. And I love it because we see good things about Luke as a person. He writes part of the synoptic gospels, the first three books, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they're very similar because they draw from the same sources, but they are also distinct. And this is what we've been looking at. As you've seen the last two weeks is we've been, Carl's been taking the beginning, the introduction, and the end of the book and saying at the beginning and the end, if you read those, you get an idea of what the book is actually about. Now, here's the cool thing. Because Luke and Acts are like part one and part two of the same book. It's like, it's like the Lord of the Rings or like the Star Wars series. Like if you just read one without the other, you'll get a little lost. So they're designed to be read together. And when we read them together, we get something, a really cool structure. And I'm going to give you a fancy pants theology word that you can use at Starbucks, right? So when you're sitting having coffee, you can put your pinky up when you're drinking your mocha loca latte or whatever it is. And then and you can say, well, did you notice the chiastic structure in the book of Luke and Acts? <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. It's theology. It sounds nerdy, but it's just shorthand for like a paragraph of knowledge. Let me put it up and you can take a look at it. So if we look at the two books together, a chiasm means that the important stuff is in the middle. The very center of these two books is the death resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. So what Luke is after you understanding is the centrality of Jesus, of trusting him as your Lord, of being forgiven, of receiving his grace. And what's even cooler, check this out. So Jesus starts, the narrative starts with him being born in this Roman empire. And then Jesus slowly moving from Galilee to Samaria to Jerusalem, then the death and the resurrection and ascension. And then after that, what happens? It's a mirror. The church starts in Jerusalem, they go out to Samaria, they go go out to Galilee, and then to all of the areas of the world. So this book is telling you what is important, and ultimately what we see from Luke-Acts, the point of those two books, Luke and Acts, is to put your trust in Jesus, to grow to be like Jesus, and to bring the good news of Jesus to the world. That's the point, right? And it's exciting. So here's what we want to do. Let's get in and let's see at the very beginning why Luke is writing this account. So we're going to start in verse 1 of Luke. And Luke says this, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. 
I like this because he's saying there are other people that have drawn up an accurate record of the actual events, the things that were fulfilled among us. And that idea of fulfilled is what Jesus has done and how God has shown himself through Jesus. Then verse 2, just as they were handed down to us by those who, for, who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. The idea here is that Luke is kind of a second generation. He wasn't an eyewitness, but he received eyewitness accounts of the things that actually happens. Here's what's so important is that the writers of, the, of Scripture, the writers in the New Testament, are not about their ideas about what Jesus did, their thoughts about Jesus, what Jesus did. They are recording the historical facts of what Jesus did as eyewitnesses. And they want to do so faithfully, right? It's not about how things they want them to be. It's about how things were. Now, this reminds me of my wedding, and one of my favorite pictures of my wedding um, is of all my groomsmen, and it's a motley crew, right? Like, so there's one seminary professor there, there are two pastors, and, the, and then there's a Marine, <laughs> and, and the Marine is, was my best man, and the day before he, 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 got, he was coming to the ceremony, he was working on his garage, and he caught a two-by-four to the face, and I said, dude, next time, catch it with your hands, um, that works a little better, <laughs> But he caught a two-by-four to the face, and he's got this good, good-sized shiner right around his eye. Now, this is how cool a guy he is. He walks in the day of the wedding, and he goes to my wife, and he says, says Holly, um, if you want me to, I can wear some makeup to cover it up. Now, that's not very marinely, right? Um, I, I think they actually, like, dis they ban you from the core if you offer to put on makeup. Um, <laughs> But, but he offered to. And then he said, and my wife's, my wife's very cool. She's like, no, 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 it's not a big deal. I want you to be as you are. And he's like, well, and also the shoes that they gave me with the tuxedo don't fit very well. So it is, is it all right if I wear my cowboy boots? And again, my wife is very cool. So she's like, no, that's totally cool. So when you see this picture, it is exactly what happened that day. And the Gospels are exactly that way. There's no Photoshopping. There's no airbrushing. It's exactly the way things happen with every pimple, wart, and blemish. And I love it because they're not interested in prettying it up. But instead, they're interested in accurately communicating what happened. They are eyewitness accounts. Now, this is what Luke says. He says, with that in mind, verse 3, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. And he did. He went back, and, and, and there's some accounts where it even talks about what Mary was thinking. It says Mary treasured these things in her heart in the early account of Jesus' birth. And some people believe that he actually went and talked to Mary, like to get her perspective on things. He researched and investigated, being very meticulous, every detail from the beginning. And then he said, I decided to write an orderly or accurate account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Now, most excellent is not a reference to Bill and Ted in any way. Instead, it is saying that, that Theophilus was a big deal. He was probably a Roman official. He may have actually been a Patreon. He may have been the, the, the one that, 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 that supplied the money for Luke to write this orderly account. Now, here's the whole point of the gospel, verse 4. So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. This is the whole reason he writes. He wants him to know that these things actually happened. And, and I love this because what this means, and this is so important, is that the Christian faith involves feelings, but it is rooted in facts. The Christian faith involves feelings. Faith does involve feelings, but it is rooted in events that actually happened. And what is more, facts do not remove the need for faith, but they anchor Jesus in historical reality. And that's so important because occasionally you'll talk to a person who's like, oh, Jesus, there's no evidence to, even that Jesus was an actual person. Now be very gentle when you correct that thought. Because there's more evidence to support Jesus' existence as a real person than there is Plato, Socrates, a number of people out there. We have more evidence from manuscript. We have more evidence from history. We have more evidence from archaeology that Jesus actually was a person. Josephus, Pliny, Tacitus, they all write about Jesus. And the cool thing is when, when, when Luke is writing, he's like, this stuff happened. This stuff happened. 
Now, there's a guy named Lee Strobel, and I don't know if you've heard that name before, but I, I love the story of Lee Strobel. So Lee Strobel, and this is a picture of him. Um, so he may not be the most, most, most handsome dude in the world, but he is one of the coolest, and I'll tell you why. So, so he it was a journalist for the Chicago Tribune, big paper. He has his master's degree from Yale Law School, so not a dummy, <laughs> Right? His job was to investigate the law side of things for the paper for the Chicago Tribune. Well, a, a, a terrible or wonderful, depending on when he was in his journey, a terrible or wonderful thing happened. But in the late 70s, his wife went to a Christian retreat and became a Christian. Now, that's a weird thing for a guy who doesn't believe in God. He went from being married to someone who believed like him to being a completely different person. And what he noticed is that she was just awesome. Like, it radically changed his life. But because he didn't believe in Jesus, he said, you know what? I'm going to do an investigation to prove my wife wrong. Now, if you're a husband or you want to be one and you ever think, I'm going to do something <laughs> to prove my wife wrong, let me give you a little bit of wisdom. Even if you're right, you're wrong, okay? That doesn't end well. But this is, his, this is what he thought he was going to do. So, so Lee Strobel goes on this mission to investigate the historical claims of Jesus. And what's so awesome is that as he did, instead of disproving Christ, he proved Christ. And Lee Strobel gave his life to the Lord and became a follower of Christ and wrote books like Case for Christ, Case for, for Faith, Case for the Creator. If you have not read these, read these books. Because we, I love that our faith is rooted in reality. Jesus isn't asking you to make some step into a black void of, of uncertainty like, I trust you. Like he's asking you to say, look at what happened. Look at the resurrection of Jesus. And then make a decision for truth. Love it. So what, what I want to do is we're looking at the Gospel of Luke. We see what Luke is after. He wants people to believe in Jesus. And then what I love about the book is it also talks about rooting and, and establishing and building your life on something that is bigger than yourself. Right? It, it says that there is a foundation of faith in Jesus that will not only give you the strength to live out this life, but will carry you through the difficulties that you know you will experience. And so, so there's a sermon in Luke 6, and I hope you read all this. We don't have time to get into all of it. But in Luke chapter 6, there's a sermon that Jesus gives, and it's called the Sermon on the Plain. It's very similar, if you're familiar, to Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount. And as Jesus talks about it, he talks about what it looks like once you respond to the love of Jesus, what it looks like to be part of the family of God. Now, I love that because when you get married, you know your family of origin, but then you, then you, then you become part of another family. And that family has different rules. So in, in my household, um, there were three boys. Now, I am just beginning to understand how much teenagers eat. Holy cow. Right? Like, I mean, like, I just have to tell my son to stop. He ate a whole pizza the other day, and he's like, I, he's just like, I've got more. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> stop eating. <laughs> and I didn't understand it, right? But when I, when I grew up, my parents, my, my, my dad and my stepmom, they had to put notes on thing in the refrigerator so we wouldn't eat them. So literally, you would open up, and it would be a post-it note city of no, 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 no. Because we were horrible. Right? I mean, I literally, I was so, I was so lazy slash hungry, which is what teenage guys are, right? You'll just eat whatever's not going to make you sick. <laughs> and so I reach into the cabinet, and all they had was French's onions. I'm like, that'll work. <laughs> right? And so, ah. Now, that would have been bad enough, but I put the lid back on and stuck it in there empty. <laughs> and Thanksgiving time, yeah, see, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that was a great, oh, because you know what's coming, right? Thanksgiving came, my stepmom went to make a meal, and there's no French's onions. Who oh, ate my French's onions? Uh, my brother James did. So here, here's the deal. When I, when I got married, my wife's family, are, they're, they're a, they're a, they, they must have invested and taken out a second mortgage on their home and food. Because when you walk into the McNay house, you can eat whatever you want. And so literally, and they, I mean the good stuff, like that ding-dongs and ho-hos and nutty buddies. Some of you know what I'm talking about. So I literally walk in, and Holly's like, yeah, just eat whatever you want. I'm like, what? what, what? Like, what, whatever I want? Like, wh whatever I want. She's like, yeah, go ahead, Namal. Okay, I'm going to eat this nutty buddy right now. Everybody's seeing me do it. <laughs> no, 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 right? <laughs> Even to this day, I can't, I, I, I look around before I eat stuff. I'm like, no one's seeing me, no one's seeing me. <laughs> it's a different way of relating. 
And so when, when Jesus is talking in the Sermon on the Plain about what it looks like to live as followers, he gives us a different vision of life. And so he's talking to his disciples, people that are following him. He's just made um, he, the decision of who his 12 disciples would be and the apostles would be. And then he goes through some very interesting concepts. And the first one he talks about is, blessed, you are blessed when you suffer. He goes through the Beatitudes. He's like, blessed when, when, when you are poor, poor in spirit and poor in this world. You are blessed when you are persecuted. You are blessed. You are fortunate. You are happy when these things happen because God has given you a new, a new understanding of reality and God is with you. So even when you suffer, it is not the same as other people that suffer. He goes on and he talks about loving your enemies. And I love this too. He's like, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It, it, it's, it's not just about loving the people that you like because everybody does that. But if you're a follower of Christ, now you even have to love the challenging people because the family of Christ looks different. And then he continues and he talks about judging other people. And, and this, this section is great because he says, don't judge people by your own standards. Quit judging people by your own standards. He says, forgive other people in the same way you've been forgiven. And I mean, these are tall orders, but this is what life looks like in the family. And then he gets into hypocrisy and he talks about blind leaders. He's like, be careful because there's some leaders out there that aren't really good. And if they don't know where they're going, then both y'all are going to fall into a pit. So don't follow people who are not actually following me. And then he continues on. He talks about the plank and the speck. And I love when Jesus uses hyperbole, right? Which is basically he blows things out of proportion to make a point. And he's like, hey, if you've got this tree trunk growing out of your eyeball, then deal with that before you notice the speck in your brother's eye. And then one of my favorite teachings, because you can imagine this guy's like, hey, and this gigantic tree sticking out of his eyeball. You got something in your eye, right? Like, do I? Where? And, and, and the point is that when, when, if we're going to help somebody, if we're going to try to lead them to the Lord, we need to do so with humility, recognizing that we have just as much dysfunction in our own hearts. It's not that we never address what's going on in other people's lives, but we do so with humility and with love because that's how God has treated us, right? So this is what talks about the family. And then finally, he gets to the tree and the fruit of the tree. And he says, by, by the fruit of the tree, you'll know what kind of tree it is. I love when Jesus talks in simple terms because I can wrap my brain around that. It's like, if someone says they're an apple tree, but they're bearing oranges, they're not an apple tree, <laughs> right? And you're like, oh, that makes sense. It does, because some people will say, hey, I'm a follower of yours, but they're not really bearing fruit. That's consistent. And he's like, and even better, he says, out of the overflow of a person's heart, their mouth speaks, right? And, and so you can, when, if, you, if you watch and you listen, you'll know what's going on. And I love it. And, and, and this is even better. At the very end, after he got done teaching all of that, he talks about what life rooted in Christ looks like. Now, he starts out in a very jarring way. And this is Luke 6, 46. And he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do as I say? Oh. <laughs> now, before you get crazy, you do this all the time. Have you ever gone to an expert and they've given you a recommendation and you haven't listened? The answer is yes. You don't even need to think about it. Just remember one time, limited to 100 times, okay? So when I tore my bicep, um, the doctor who, who carved me up and reattached my bicep, he said, hey, when you get done, the nerve block is going to wear off. And so I'm going to give you a prescription, and you need to make sure four hours after the surgery you take this pill. And I said, sure. Four hours, I'll put it on my watch. Doc, thank you. I appreciate it. Four hours. Now, in the back of my mind, I thought, hmm for the average person that needs such pain medication. <laughs> now you're laughing, but you're laughing because you've done it, right? And so I was like, no, oh, this will be fine. Literally, they jammed something in my nerve so I didn't feel any pain in my arm. And I was like, ha, 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 because you couldn't feel anything, right? And then all of a sudden, you could. Um, and I was like, oh, 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 oh. And it was, it was like, it, it seriously, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm a total cake eater, but it hurt so bad. It was like there was a man with a flamethrower and a jackhammer doing work on my arm and in my brain. I'm like, oh, I was in this like cyclone of pain. And, and, and I'm like, man, if I had just listened, do you see Jesus's point? Because he's saying, if you say that I am your Lord, 
then it makes sense to do what I tell you to do, right? If Jesus is the Lord of your life, then, then we are all people that are, are trying to be more and more obedient, to follow him more closely, not because it earns his love, but because we've already received it. We want to grow into becoming the people that he wants us to be. And I love the way he says this because he gives an analogy. And he says, as for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. Did you hear that? So it's so good. I love this. Come to me, hear my words, and then what? Put them, see that part we usually <laughs> leave out, or at least I do? I put them into practice. Actually do what you've learned. I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. I love this because the gospel is about building your life upon faith in Jesus. And when you build your life, when you put what Jesus says into practice, rooted in a relationship with him, your life can withstand the trials of the the hardships that you will encounter. And so here's the deal. A wise man once said that if you live long enough, you'll bleed. And, and, And I know this doesn't sound very happy, clappy. You're like, Eric, stop it with reality. Can't we just enjoy church? I'm like, but here's the deal. I don't want to leave you unequipped. Life is hard. Now, if you, if you tell me, like, man, I've made it this far and I've never struggled. Okay, you come and talk to me after. I just want to know how you did that, okay, and if you're on some kind of drugs. So, um, but, sorry, that's not funny. All right, so um, the, the point is this, though. Legitimately, if you live long enough, life gets hard. You will lose a spouse. You will lose a child. You will lose a relationship. You will lose your job. You will be in financial difficulty. Your health will go down the toilet. Life is hard. We should expect that. Jesus says, in this life, you will have troubles. Not not maybe, but you will. So here's the thing. What will actually sustain you? The human experience is universal. There's not a person out there that has not experienced trouble. And when trouble comes, it reveals the strength of what your life is built on. And a life not built on Christ, according to Luke, recording what Jesus said directly, Jesus says in verse 49, but the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. And, and, and this is what he's talking about. In Colorado, we get this idea of, you know, Colorado, we have bentonite. Is anybody's house built on bentonite and had a problem with that? What it looks like is a firm foundation until it rains like the kind of rain that we've been getting. And then your foundation cracks because it's not built actually on, on, on solid rock. And, and, and in the same way, in that time when Jesus was writing, the, the, the soil in, in, in the area of Israel that he was, he was preaching to these people, it looked like hard concrete. I mean, it was sun-baked. So you thought, man, I can just build this house. I don't even need to dig the, the, the five, ten feet down until I hit bedrock. I'll just build it right on top. But then when the rain came and that soil turned into sand, everything fell apart. To so hear what Jesus is saying, and this is the point of Luke. Luke says, come to know me, but then as you grow, build your life on me. I'm not just an addition. I am the foundation. I'm not just, a, just an added guest room. I am the building. And if you place your faith in me and you build your life on the things that I have told you, you will be able to, to, to last during the hardships of life. And I love hearing that because not just, not just some pie-in-the-sky faith, but it's some deep faith that can even weather the difficulties of the storms that eventually will come or, as you've already lived, have come. So what does that mean for us now? And here's what I would encourage you. A few things of like, well, what's my next step from all this? Well, first of all, I, I want to encourage you sometime, get alone and get, get small, get still. So this is one of the hardest things for us to do. Mo- most of the time, we drive way too fast in a car that's not designed for it. You know what I mean? Our, our lives are moving so fast that we have to just keep our attention on the wheel because we're, we're out of control. And, and, and we, we are... We are so distracted by life. Imagine not being on your cell phone or your computer for a week. Could you do that? Does that make you break out in a flop sweat right now? 
because most of us need to keep up that pace because it keeps us from really looking at our lives objectively. So I would encourage you, get alone and get still. Blaise Pascal, who's a much wiser man than I am, he's a mathematician, he's a theologian, brilliant. He said that most of humanity's problems stem from their inability to sit in a room quietly. I agree with him. I think even more in our, in, in our culture, we have to continue to distract ourselves. We're like a, 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 a VW Beetle doing 125 down the Big Thompson Canyon. Like we can't think about, yeah, right? Woo! <laughs> yeah! But you've got to keep your eyes on the road. So get still. Get small. Second, evaluate. Evaluate. So one of, the, one of the things I appreciate is that when we get still and we get small, we can take stock of our life, not to shame us, not to make us feel guilty, but to actually see how things are going. Um, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of Dr. Phil, right? But, but one thing that he says is totally awesome. He's like, how's that working for you? <laughs> so he just gets crazy folk, right? Just crazy folk. And, and sometimes people like, I, don't know, I know people like that. He gets crazy folk and he's like, so you see you're crazy, right? But, but, but his way of saying that is, how's that working for you? So we look at our life sometimes, and if we're totally honest, we may have this great system of belief, and we like life is just functioning the way it should, but we don't actually evaluate how that, that Volkswagen Beetle is doing at 125 miles an hour. And so evaluate. And again, this is not for shame. This is not to shame you. It's not to make you feel guilty, but it's to say, how's that actually going? And I, I, I guarantee you if you do that, because even putting this talk together, I've had to take stock. One of the great things about preaching a sermon like this is that God convicts me probably even more than he convicts you. I, I've got this guy in my life that is probably one of the most discouraging individuals I know. Like he's just a dude that everything you do is not good enough. Does anybody have someone like that? And so I'm putting this sermon together and, and I'm, I'm going through this. I'm like, okay, Lord, Lord, do as I say. I'm like, oh, that part about loving your enemies. Hmm. And, and I'm literally, and God's like, you need to move towards him with abundant love. I'm like, no. <laughs> it's like, Eric, are you going to tell a couple thousand people, why do you say Lord, Lord, and not do as I say, and then not do as I say? I'm like, mm, I don't want to. But it involves trust, right? And so that's the next thing. Trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. And so that, that's kind of a twofold thing. First of all, if you've never actually trusted Jesus, let me tell you what that looks like. The offer that Jesus offers each one of us is freedom, is freedom. So if you get to a point where you're still and small and realize that you've just barely been making it, that you know there's more to life than this, that you haven't experienced the fullness of life yet, and maybe you're struggling with so much junk in your path that it is that's choking you off, trust Jesus. Because what Jesus says is that when you trust in him, when you put your faith on him, that you are brought from death to life, from darkness to light, that you are given a new life, that you are a new creation. This is what God himself promises you. It's something that you can never do for yourself. But by trust in Jesus, you can be forgiven and live a new life. And for many of us, when we hear, Lord, Lord, why do you say that and not do as I say, that, that sticks us a little bit. Maybe there's some areas of our lives where we, we look at our lives and we say, you know what, I'm God, I'm not trusting you in this area. And so the last thing I would say is this, is go deeper. Go deeper. There's more of God's love. There's more of God's life to be found in obedience. And I know when you hear the word obedience, we're like, oh man, I don't like that. Let me just give you a simple truth that's very profound. Obedience to Christ is freedom. I know that sounds like that shouldn't make sense, but the, the closer we walk with Jesus, the more we allow him to live through us and we live the way that he's called us to, not because we're earning his love, but because he already loves us. When we live that way in obedience, we experience the freedom and the fullness of life that he has called us to. And I don't know about you, but I want more of that. Even standing here right now, and I'm saying it out loud, and I've said it a couple times, I'm like, I want more of that. More than wanting more than that, I need more of that. And I love that we have a God that freely, freely offers it if we would just trust in him. And so that is the good offer that Luke points us to in Luke and in Acts. It's a good offer that is for you today. And I would just ask that in these moments as we pray and finish our service with song, that you would consider trusting 
Jesus. Let's stand and pray as we get ready for our last song. Lord, Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that we can say that you are truly good, that you have a plan for each person in this room and that you desire to give them freedom and the fullness of life, that our lives, our lives would reflect your amazing grace. And so God, I pray even in these moments, even right now, God, that you would help us to draw close to you, that you would help us to trust you more and that we might live our lives in the fullness of the freedom that is promised in your son, Jesus, by faith alone. God, today, might we draw closer to you and experience the life that you have promised. And in doing so, God, shine the light of your love and your grace and your truth into a world that desperately needs it. God, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' strong name. Amen.